Hey, how's it going? This is Tom Seymour. Um, this is the the second video I'm doing on filmmaking, and so um, a few of you guys asked me about screenwriting, so I figured I'd just jump into it and and tell you what I know. Most of the scripts I've, I've done are uh, original, so I've directed eight feature films, and um, seven of those have been original. The one that's not original was an adaptation that I did of a Rudyard Kipling short, short story called Mark of the Beast, and I'll actually show you a page from that later. Uh, so basically it's like this, so some, of the, some of you guys were asking how do I, where did I get the ideas and where they come from and how do I write them and things like that. So, um, you know, I'm a huge movie geek so I'm always sort of scheming about cool ideas for movies. But when I'm writing I usually try to think practical, I usually try to choose locations that I know I can get, I usually try to write around, you know, things that I may have, you know. If I know a guy who can can get fake guns, I'll write a fake gun into the the movie. If I know a guy um, with Mark of the Beast, for example, one of my best friends, Tim Kulig, and uh, his wife Chi, um, had had access to this gorgeous camp, and we shot basically on a camp for ten days uh, to, for Mark of the Beast, and it was amazing. So, you know, try try to write to the strengths of the things that you have. You know, you know, if you live in New England. You know, maybe shoot in the fall. You know, maybe you because you know the foliage looks so so rich. It's like free um, set design. Just try to use try to use what you have, and I, I say that only because um, you can somehow you can usually make it look like you have a lot more money. Uh, I did one movie called London Betty, and we basically got permission to shoot at this place called Wild Bills, which had this whole crazy carnival in the back of it like rides and all these crazy houses and I basically wrote it into the plot where this crazy mayor built all this stuff in his backyard. So it makes us look like we put all this production value. You know, I used a few techniques to try to marry the two sets together. Like there's these two giant clowns and we had we positioned them, you know, in one shot and we had the walked actor uh walking up towards them between them from a low angle. And then we cut to the opposite angle we cut to a different set, we bring those same two clowns on the set and then we have him walking in from, from the other angle, but you can see you can see the set around it. So it's like this way of carrying over from one set to another. But this is just a trick we did. And so you know, can you imagine if we did it Hollywood style and built a a carnival in the back of a mansion? Like it's insane. Anyway, so that's that's the type of thing that we'll do. Um so anyway, the, so the way I, I'd come from basically an idea to a script is that I start formulating these ideas in my head and slowly over time they evolve. And I used to, when I first started out, I'd, t I'd get a really clever idea or idea I thought, I thought was clever and I would, you know, I'd write it on a scrap of paper and put it in my wallet because I just liked doing that. And then after a while, you know, it became this big Costanza type wallet. I'd pull out the ideas and see see what it had and try to write it into something. Um, that that actually is not the greatest process. You know, your ideas tend to be sort of scattered all over the place. I do like writing down things. Um, there is something um, there is something to take an idea, taking an idea in your head and writing it down. And when you write it down it actually becomes something physical. You've actually brought something into this realm. Actually writing Basically, um, one of the biggest tools I use, or I used to use, was a, a book called um, The Screenwriter's Workbook, and I think it was by Sid Field. And I'm not saying it's the most amazing book ever. All I'm saying is that it worked for me, and where I have the most trouble is not with things like dialogue and whatever, banter, or, you know jokes or whatever dramatic scenes I, I don't I mean regardless you may think my stuff is crap but I, I don't have trouble writing that down where I have trouble is the structure and so the great thing about the screenwriters workbook is that it's actually a workbook and it's cheap I think it's like 20 bucks if you walk through the steps if you do what it says at the end of the book you'll have a script a feature script it tells you you know, um, the different, you know, the, the three acts and how there's rising action, falling action before, uh, you know, um, 
you know, during the acts, rather. It, it's very structured, and you can sort of feel free to break those rules, but the great thing is, is, is that you could be comfortable knowing that you have a basic structure. But the book does stuff like, it says, you know, break, you know, I'm paraphrasing, so I'm probably going to butcher it, but it'll say, like, break, break the screen, the, the, the idea down into three acts, you know, and then write 15 events that happen within each act. 15 here, 15. 15 for the first act. Let's see, let's do it over here. 15 for the first act, 15 for the second act, 15 for the third act. And these are events. But once you plan all that stuff out, you know where you're writing, you know where you're going. And that's when that's when a lot of the good stuff comes out. It's because when you know where you're going, you're sort of freed up to play. Because you, uh, you're you freed up to break the rules if you want. You're freed up to go to that area. But at least you can see the overall picture. You can see the, the, the arc of everything. And so... Um, rather than tying you down, I actually think it frees you up, you know, because you really can uh, feel free to get creative with the dialogue and you don't have to be nervous about, does this make sense or where am I going or is this, you know, is this drivel if this if this is good? And um, So that's the way I see it anyway. I think it's, um, for if you're a little more like me, if you're... If you're not so much structured as you are, you're creative and you you work hard, but you don't actually um, you're not so good at writing structure. Um, then I, I would recommend that book, Screenwriter's Workbook. Once you get once you get through when you finish your first draft, I mean, most people never finish a screenplay because they they think it's too precious, and they start writing and they go, wow, this is crap and I don't like it, and they never finish because they're perfectionists. And, um, you know, there's this quote, it's like uh, General Patton, George S. Patton, has this quote like, a, a good plan violently executed today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow, or something like that. But I take that to say, try, just try to barrel through your first draft. Look, you, you're going to feel like it sucks at some point. You know, unless you're an egomaniac, you're not going to think that it's brilliant the whole way through and that you're perfect. You kind of have to force your way through until you get this first act. And the first act will be a mess. And probably what you should do is take that first act and put it away and not look at it for a little while. Maybe even a month or two. Pull it back out. Go through it. You will be amazed at how many things are glaring once you take a break from it and come back to it. Then you, re you rewrite. Rewrite the hell out of it and get a second draft. And then I think that's where you start showing it to people. And show it to many groups of people. Show it to a lot of people. Get a lot of feedback. And the way I do it is when things start to coincide, if eight people say, hey dude, this is long here, I hate this character, if a ton of people are saying it, you should probably listen. If one person says, I don't like this character, or, you know, whatever, this, this plot line is stupid, and no one ever concurs, you know, maybe just throw that out. I'm not saying do what everyone wants, but you can't be stubborn, and you can't think that you're brilliant, you know. Maybe you are. Um, I don't work that way. I take as much advice as I can, can, I can and see what coincides. You know, the same thing happens once you get to the editing process. You know, once you're editing your film, you get a rough cut, you show it to people. You gotta take your medicine. Show it to people you trust and give feedback. And if it coincides, if eight people think this joke is, is terrible and slowing down your film, cut it out. You can't be afraid to cut it out. In a script, too, you can't be afraid to to cut out something that you initially thought was great, you know, I mean, you have to, you know, you have to sort of be a butcher that way, you know. Um, so once you get the script done, um, there's, there's several steps that you do to sort of prep the script before you shoot. But let me say this first, being an underground filmmaker, 
a lot of what I try to do is get the get to stretch the dollar. You know, so if we have ten or twenty grand to shoot on, you really try to make that get enough bang for the buck. And so in in some of our movies, we've had some very notable actors like you know um, Clint Howard, Danny Von Bargan, Ellen Muth. These character actors are very important to us, and they're hard to get, and they're expensive. Uh, they're not as expensive as, you know, A-listers, but you have to pay them. These are people you have to pay. So you don't always get access to them for long, extended periods of time. So what you may learn to do is write smarter. That's what I've tried to do. It's basically like if I'm hiring Clint Howard to narrate the film, okay, have it all prepped so you're hiring for one day. So it's one day, one paycheck, you're out. Daniel and Bargain, same thing. I wrote a character role in London Betty. In or for a famous character actor, actor. Daniel Lundbargen, if you look him up, he's been in everything from Super Troopers to Seinfeld to Oh Brother Wild Down, Mark, Mark, uh, Malcolm in the Middle. So I like that guy. So I sought that guy out. And I said, look, I can pay you X amount and hire you for, you know, a full 10-hour day. And I was like, here's the part. His part was a newspaper editor. And all of his scenes were at his, uh, at the the newspaper headquarters, which he, like, ran out of his house or whatever. Um, so he was always in the same location. And so basically what we did was we changed outfits and, you know, we changed, uh, you know, some of the lighting schemes, but we never had to move locations with him. So he's probably in five or six scenes throughout London, Betty, and he's a significant supporting actor. Like, he's not a cameo. He's got a good supporting role. Especially in an ensemble like Glenda Betty, where there's like 10 main characters. His part is actually very important, and it's got a through line, and it's it's a good part, or I think it is anyway. So he read the part, and he's like, yeah, I like this, I want to do this. So we, we did it, but we shot him all in one day. And if you look, his film, his part is spliced throughout the whole film. He pops out. Uh, in the first minutes, then five minutes in, then 15 minutes in, half hour in, 45 minutes in, you know, 80 minutes in.